So since January, a group of 16 people have been gathering quite regularly here at Megaphone. And together we've gained skills and shared insights into what it's like to be a drug user living in Vancouver. This group is the Megaphone Speakers Bureau. And we're so excited to be here tonight in our fourth and final event in our launch series. I am Sakani Duckhouse, and I am one of the peer coordinators here at the Speakers Bureau. Hi, my name is Krista Butler. I am the Speakers Bureau Program Manager. Uh, it's great to be here, here tonight. So this project exists to build understanding to feel compassionate, effective, and evidence-based responses to the overdose crisis. What we know is that our current approach isn't working. To end the overdose crisis, we need to understand how and why people are using drugs and create laws and policies that reflect this reality. Members of the Megaphone Speakers Bureau all have lived experience with drug use. We are the experts in those experiences. And people with power rarely listen to us. And, and we're rarely brought to table to make decisions around solutions. So we created our own table. Through the Speakers Bureau, people with lived experience with drug use lead conversations to help our communities, our loved ones, healthcare providers, policymakers, and more understand the life experiences of people who use drugs. And beyond that, we help to people, we help people ar around us learn how to dismantle their own internal bias to better support people who use drugs. By being here tonight, you're part of that change and you're part of a community that cares. We're grateful here to gather, uh, gathered on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Um, Megaphone continues to work at understanding our role in colonial systems and changing public conversations and centering the voices of indigenous and marginalized people. I'd like now to invite up knowledge keeper of the Squamish nation, Rebecca Campbell Duncan to the stage who will share an opening blessing and welcome. Hi to me, that's Kotmish, Humatquim, and Salewatu, Stomo. Hello, everybody. My true name is Tita Echemak. My English name is Rebecca, and I come from both the Squamish and the Musqueam nations. It is such an honor, honor for me to welcome you to this sacred land we call Come Come Alive. Can everybody say that? Come Come, come Alive. alive. Uh, it means the place of many maple trees, mm. which is, and there was just groves and groves from here all the way down near Gore Street. It was just beautiful maple, and we get a lot of good uh, licorice root and the best paddles. So it's, um, really precious trees for us. Um, I'd like to bring us all together and follow Scottish protocol. Bring us together and start our event in a proper way with good, good feelings, good thoughts, and as one, as family, all together in our canoe, if you will. Uh, I'd like to sing for you my brother, Chief Ian Campbell, his journey song that just came to him on his journey to Bella Bella. So the words in here you'll hear uh, sing about what it takes to make a successful journey, and that includes always picking each other up. We never <laughs> kick each other, you know, kick a brother or sister down. We always, always support one another, mm -hmm. lift each other up, and ho have peace among one another, and always treat each other with kindness and respect. So if we can do that, the basic teachings in life, we'll, we'll get a nice glide in our mm -hmm. canoe and work together. Oh, Sam. Oh, <coughs>
Thank you, and thank you again for being here. Now I'd like to welcome Kari Wendell McClelland, our fantastic host. I'm taking a moment because the moment is precious in that, um, well, this is the last of a series of four events. And so there's something very precious and honoring about the way that I have uh, been given the opportunity to support something that is so very important. And uh, I don't take it lightly, so I just want every single one of you to know how much I appreciate you giving me this place in your lives to support you through this journey. It's been a huge honor for me. I just want you to know that. I, uh, I, also, I also want you to know that um, and I think probably most of you are already aware of this, but this is serious business, you know? I also really believe that, um, you know, in our societies throughout time and definitely in many of our traditional societies, we still have room for songs that, that help us to move through our grief. We still have space for telling the stories that help us to learn from the things that are hard. We still have a place for humor in our lives, even through the darkest of times. Sometimes that's the thing that actually allows us to survive the hardest things. And so whilst this is a very serious, serious subject that we are and challenge that we're trying to, to meet, I also want you to know that there's still space for all of those other things. And that our capacity for connecting to those things are what helps us to survive the worst, the worst of things. There's this reality that we are facing where some people get to talk a lot and have had their stories told a lot. And then there's other people who haven't had their stories heard very much. And one of the things that I'm really like so proud of in the way that these events have come together is that it's really centering voices that often don't get heard. That wisdom we're actually missing out on. And I think a lot of people really care about trying to make significant change, but they're really missing a very key piece of the puzzle. And um, so I'm really excited to introduce a very uh, wise and powerful speaker and sharer of story, my friend Nicholas. That's perfect. Thank you, Kari. Uh, hi, my name is Nicholas Cryer. I work as a coordinator with the Speakers Bureau here, but tonight I'm here as a storyteller. I just want to take a moment to um, thank Megaphone, thank 312, uh, Krista, my co-facilitator, Connie, and all my speakers. I'm so proud of all of you. You've done a great job. Um, so we're here to speak about stigma tonight. And as a long-term recreational user of illicit drugs in Vancouver, I might know something about that. Um, for me, the discrimination that comes with drug use is often very subtle, or they think it's subtle, um, but it's still very harmful. Stigma is spoken in hushed tones and behind people's backs. The person may not even be aware of it. And the people doing the stigmatizing, just they don't get it. So I'm a Cree. I was born in Alberta, I'm from Saddle Lake. I live uh, with the impacts of intergenerational trauma of both my mother and my father, whom I never met. I also live with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, 
And uh, I was also apprehended at birth, shuffled through multiple abusive foster homes by the time I was two. At 18 months, I was blessed to be adopted into an upper middle class family and, and the abuse stopped. But like I said, the, the effects of the intergenerational trauma with permanent behavioral catastrophes, FASD and ADHD, uh, eventually the damage had already been done and, and it, it led me to alcohol and drugs in the streets. Um, when I was 18 months, yes, oh, sorry, when I was 12, I was removed from my, my adoptive home and placed back in foster care and, um, and then a group home in Calgary for Indigenous youth, most of whom were already involved with drugs. So then I didn't really consider the implications of my drug use at the time because it was actually through the use of the drugs with my new peers that I found what I thought I'd always been seeking, which was acceptance. Um, it sounds so cliche. I mean, <laughs> just want to fit in. But what I actually found was drugs, which I mistook for acceptance. It was an honest mistake. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, after having never fit in with family or with, you know, school or girls or any job I ever had, I, I just thought maybe I could fit in with these people here in this dirty alley doing drugs. Um, and the people with drugs were always generally okay with me, as long as I had drugs too. Um, and of course, the acceptance was really just sort of a vague tolerance of me you know, sort of reaching out from their own lonely existence, um, an attempt at the connection they'd, you know, always sought, maybe sought in me, despite their bare judgment. Um, and isn't that how it always is? I mean, we take the risk of having our hearts broken to make the connection, or we end up having them broken anyway from not having reached out at all, or worse, reached out too late. I was just lonely, lonely and scared that no one liked me, that I wasn't good enough. I've been street bound since I was 18. Um, and crystal meth has been my drug of choice since arriving in downtown Eastside about 12 years ago. But I'm not here to defend drugs, right? I'm not here to condemn them. Uh, I'm not ignorant to the, the damage they do people that do the drugs and their family and friends. It's very serious stuff. But if we really look honestly, we begin to see that in, in most cases, um, the damage was there before the drugs. Um, I'm here because I wanted to challenge the stigma that's associated with drug use. Stigma that does real harm. I've seen it and experienced it. I sat in the emergency room at St. Paul's for five hours in anaphylactic shock with my face falling out to here and I didn't even see a doctor that day. Um, I've walked down, I've seen rejection based solely on the idea that if you use drugs then, which are legal, so you're a criminal and then you must be a bad person. Or at the very least you can't be trusted, even to take a shower. Um, I've walked down some of the most affluent streets in Canada and been ashamed to be there because of all the good citizens staring at me with hate in their eyes. I long for the safety and acceptance of East Hastings where trauma and struggle and the, the beauty of overcoming them is well known to me. To, uh, to our close-knit community of survivors. I'm here for the bad people who never even got a chance to speak, let alone even knew they had a voice. Me, I live an amazing life. I'm grateful for it. Despite the apprehension at birth and then the foster homes and the FASD and the ADHD and um, you know, jail time, uh, despite struggling and the chaos and melancholy that comes with chasing and acquiring and actually doing drugs, I'm really grateful for all of it because I lived through it. 
and without that lived experience, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have the perspective I have now. The very unique perspective of being able to see that the power and balance of stigma is at least half the battle in this drug crisis. Right? Otherwise, I would, I would have just been perished. I would have been dead. It's easy to lay blame on people we don't even know, especially when they committed the obvious moral failure of becoming addicted to their opiate prescription that they got from their doctor, right? Mm -hmm. I might overhear the occasional muttering, ew, he does that mess stuff? Gross, how does he live with himself? How indeed? Well, I've learned in my 12 years of wandering around this city, growing literally hundreds of friendships, working relationships, um, that the unfortunate truth about stigmatization, about judgment, ignorance, and bullying, um, is that they're pretty much to be expected. Um, society jumps at every chance to blame drug users for their circumstances. In fact, we paint our fellow citizens and their drugs with a fairly wide and unforgiving brush. We can blame the whole drug world and, uh, and its history on one user that we see languishing in the shadows of back alleys. Right? Whether they're hustling or struggling or God forbid, slipping into a fatal overdose, we're judging them. Instead of tending to the spiritual wounds that are, that are often the cause, the root cause of, of drug-seeking behaviors, we build a wall of stigma and shame and stereotype around our most vulnerable and hurting citizens, so thick that it acts like a prison. The thought of self-love simply ceased to exist for me. And that's not uncommon for drug users. And then we're sealed in by policies, which solidify the fear-based segregation as the only sensible solution. The beauty of this, the fix, um, sorry. I'd say analyzing policies is a good starting point, right? It's not for everybody. Um, you can get trained in can today. Criminalizing drugs, it just doesn't work. Um, it creates fear, it separates us. It causes people to use alone. I've used alone. And not knowing if, if I was gonna live through that time of using alone, and I don't even do opiates, right? Um, last year we had more than 1,500 preventable overdose deaths in BC alone. Um, and that's, this is like ground zero. The beauty of this grim situation, though, is that I believe we can change it. I suppose it's ironic that the solution might come from drug users. I mean, who's on that? Um, but I'm not just a drug user, right? I'm also a father of an eight-year-old boy named Money. I'm a husband, I'm a writer, I'm a musician, I'm an actor. Um, I'm an overdose responder with Spikes on Bikes and a couple other things, I think. Um, <laughs> and then I'm no, I'm no life expert, right? Um, but I do love my neighbor. It just seems like a good idea. It seems like a good example for, you know, the little ones so they can maybe change the world too someday. Um, it's like a friend of mine always says, Speakers Bureau has adopted this motto because we believe in it and we try to live by it. That drugs aren't the problem, it's the way we treat each other. In my traditional culture, trusting someone with your personal story is the highest honor you can bestow on someone. Very sacred. So I feel very honored that Speakers Bureau has trusted me with their stories and that I'm able to trust them and all of you with mine. So thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. And now I'll invite Chris to come up. Thanks for coming. Good to see you. Uh, my name's Chris. <clears throat> I'm just going to 
was born in 1962 in a small town in southern Ontario. I was a middle child between an older brother and a younger sister. <clears throat> My father a truck driver. Mom stayed at home to care for us kids. I was raised on TV, and in the early years, TV consisted of cartoons, you know. Graduated up to sitcoms and dramas, and Brady Bunch, Partridge Family, Adams Family. And, and of course, the wonderful world of Disney, you know, with its family programs. And through these and other programming, the idea of what family was and how they acted was imprinted on my psyche. For all intents and purposes, my family seemed to mirror the exact morals and sense of love as the families on these shows. We were a Norman Rockwell painting. My parents never drank. They didn't beat each other or us. And there was no sexual assault ever occurred on any front. And then shortly after my 13th birthday, my world was shattered. My father was off and gone on the road and for days at a time. Because he was gone so often, my mother's sister would stay with us. I awoke in the middle of the night to the sound of a man's voice that I thought was my father's. I raced down the stairs to welcome him home. Mid-staircase, my mom stopped me. Get back to bed. But I want to see Dad. Your dad isn't home, but I heard his voice. You were dreaming, just get back to bed. I was sure that I had heard him, so I woke early the next morning and raced down to be the first to welcome him home. And when I got to the living room, I figured I must be the first one awake, so I turned the TV on. While sitting quietly on the couch, I noticed an envelope with my father's name on it. Being a snoopy little boy, of course, I, um, I opened it and began to read. When I was finished, I replaced it in its envelope, turned the TV off, and ran back to bed, hoping that with any luck, I would awake from this nightmare. <clears throat> the letter stated the reasons that my mother decided to desert her family it was because she didn't want to be left alone for days on end while Dad was on the road, left to raise three kids by herself. In fact, according to the letter, she didn't want kids in the first place. <clears throat> My father immediately began to search for her. And around day 10 of my mother's disappearance, my father came to me and asked if I had any friends with a baseball bat. I knew Byron, the clerk across the street, he had one, so I ran to get it. I returned to where my dad was waiting and gave him the bat, thinking that we we're going to play ball at the park. But he opened his trunk, threw the bat inside, looked at me, told me to go find my brother, and then drove away. <clears throat> I would never see him again. <clears throat> that night, following a lead to my mother's whereabouts, that's why he had the bat. He died in a car crash. My siblings and I were then sent to live with Grandma on Dad's side of the family. Within a year, I was sent to a psychiatric hospital in the nearby city of London, Ontario. I just I couldn't cope. Six months later, I was released and returned to Grandma's house. I dropped out of school after the great eighth grade and was left to fend for myself. In 1976, the stigma of the psych ward was devastating. <clears throat> I've been a drug user ever since, 44 years now. I've had four significant, significant relationships in my, in my life and that were destined to fail. The Disney family dynamic that was imprinted on my brain was an impossible goal, but I spent my life trying to achieve the impossible over and over. At the end of my last relationship, I'd been separated from my girlfriend for eight months. We had two boys, three and four years old. I was working in Kelowna until I could figure things out. But while I was there, an old back injury resurfaced and I ended up in the hospital where they did steroid injections and tractions to no avail. So I returned to Vancouver 
I mean, the days I was to have the first of two surgeries to correct the discs in my lower back. While in VGH, I was in contact with my girlfriend who was living on Vancouver Island. We talked about me coming home upon release, but when the time came, she stopped answering the phone and I was left in the dark for three days. On the fourth day, she finally did answer, only to tell me she was moving in with her mom and changing her phone number and not to bother looking for her. I went to a dark place at that time. I didn't care if I lived or died. Leaving the hospital, I had nowhere to go but a shelter in the downtown east side. I began to abuse the pain meds, and when they ran out, I turned to crack. I began to spend every waking moment panhandling to support my habit. I sat at the base of a tree. <clears throat> Sorry, I sat at the base of a tree in front of BCIT at the corner of Seymour and Dunsmere in downtown Vancouver. I panhandled before. After each failed relationship, I would, I would return to the street shelters, food lines, and crack pipes. During these times, I was assaulted, insulted, spat on, degraded in every way by passers-by while panhandling. <clears throat> so I thought I had perfected my intu intuitive screening of people as they passed by, determining my chances as a drop of cash or getting kicked, which was more likely. But mostly I screened to see who had achieved the Disney family dynamic, and they were on my hit list. And after my last failed attempt at normality, when I saw the same people on their way to work every day, I saw my failures and their success, and I grew angry. <clears throat> there was one woman who would come by on her way to work, a whole Renfrew. She was in her 70s, frail little woman from Paris, France. Trying not to make eye contact with her didn't work. She walked straight at me. And in the tiniest of voices, I asked if I'd had breakfast. This began a relationship that would drastically change my life. Mm. Whole Renfrew woman came by a few times a week with a toonie to put towards my breakfast. <clears throat> And on one of those stops, she bent down to tell me things would get better and I'd be okay. Then suddenly a woman grabbed her shoulder, turned her around and told her not to talk to me or give me change, and that I was a drug user and would just use the money to pick up. Oh, ran through woman, re removed the woman's hand and told her to mind her own business. <clears throat> then turned to me and said, don't mind her. She's just an angry old woman. You're going to be fine. And one day you'll get up from that spot and get on with it. You know, whole Renfrew woman was the only person, to my knowledge, that ever stood up for me. And we were strangers. I don't know the woman that grabbed your shoulder, co-worker I've assumed. Whoever she was, she felt strongly that I was a danger and that I shouldn't be approached. That hurt. I couldn't disappoint a whole rent through woman, so I quickly got up off that sidewalk, stopped panhandling, and was determined to make good on her wish for me. <clears throat> I began selling Megaphone magazine. It was a job and a step up. I believed that selling Megaphone might change things, that it could change the way the world, or at least the people at Seymour and Dunsmere looked at me. I'd show them, I'd show them that even a guy in my condition could pick himself up, dust himself off, and try something a little different to better his life. <clears throat> With each magazine sold, my customers would slowly let me in on who they were. Whole Renfrew woman changed every interaction that I have had with a human being since. And in turn, the ones I connected with have altered their perspective of what a drug user could be. <clears throat> that was nine years ago. A lot's changed for me. <clears throat> After I began writing for Megaphone, 
I began to present my work in public forums. I had won a best pitch contest, and uh, my customers came to support me in that. It was the first story I ever had published. I would eventually present my work at the Vancouver International Writers Festival two years running, and my customers rallied at both events to support me. One of those in, ten, ten, in attendance was Shannon, an English instructor who helped set up a lecture on, the, on street safety that I had put together for her class. She was my biggest fan. But my greatest achievement to date was reconciling with my brother and sister after 25 years of no contact. The only family I spoke to in that time was an aunt. <clears throat> after two years of working at a jeweler's, I had returned home after work to, to a message from my sister, of all people. She felt I needed to know that my mom had died. I was able to attend the funeral. I would fly back to Ontario and be re reunited with my family after all that time. I keep in contact with them now on a monthly basis. I had hoped that I had hoped to change the way people looked at me. I did, I did that. But more importantly, I changed how I looked at myself and others. All this because a frail little woman from France looked beyond the panhandler and saw something of potential. If you're wondering, I still see Hope Renfrew woman. I met her daughter and granddaughter this past Christmas, and we shared hugs. My name's Chris, and I enjoy a little cocaine after work. Thanks for listening tonight. Problem. 
My friend then asked if there was a problem. Um, sorry, he's lost me, please. <laughs> okay. Um, when I, my friend then turned towards me, when I looked up his, at him, his facial expression was very worrisome. The staff then said that I was going to have to leave the drop-in center. My friend and I went outside and I immediately asked my friend what he saw when he looked at me in the drop-in center. He told me that the whites of my eyes were yellow and even my skin looked yellow. I wasn't thinking anything serious about it. In fact, the first thought in my head was that I must have ate something that maybe made my skin turn color, like when someone eats too many carrots and they get an orange tint to their skin. I thought that it was something like that. I didn't find out about my serious health issue until a couple days later. By being singled out publicly, um, it caused me to feel very worthless, unwanted, and as though I was not good enough or deserving enough to have the basic things in life that most people take for granted. I didn't think that there was, it was very professional of the drop-in staff. They could have took me to the side and privately said what they said away from all the people that were in the lobby who heard the whole horrible experience. Um, Richard, I'm wondering if you can uh, share an experience where maybe you felt like you were really seen and respected, um, where you felt like your humanity was really honored. Uh, yeah, I could uh, tell you about a time like that. Um, I, in uh, my journey for healing and getting my life together, I uh, joined the church. Um, it was a uh, family church in Burnaby, and uh, about maybe the third Sunday, I just started attending that church. It was a family church. Uh, there's a lot of uh, children there, and teenagers, and uh, people of uh, seniors, adults of different ages. Uh, really a nice family community church. And uh, about the third Sunday uh, after services, I was sitting there and I was watching all the young people moving around and, f and fellowship and socializing. And, Whatnot, and they look so healthy and so bright, and their futures look so promising because they had decent parents that you know didn't drink and they worked hard and uh, they were raising their kids well. And it was uh, such a contrast from the life that I had at their age. I mean, at their age, I was running around the streets and alleys of uh, Winnipeg, uh, an undernourished, uh, uh, traumatized kid uh, with alcoholic parents. Um, and I, I found the contrast so extreme that I started to feel guilt and shame, especially about my drug use, uh, because I felt like I was, uh, I didn't belong uh, with these people uh, because they were just, the, the contrast was so different and I had trouble getting over that. So um, I decided that I'm going to uh, go talk to my pastor. So I went and speak to my pastor and I said, uh, Pastor, listen, I, I want you to know who you have in your church. I want you to know that I'm a drug user and I have drug issues. And he said to me, thank you. And I was taken aback a bit, I said, what? Thank you, he said, for that confession. And he put his arm on my shoulder and he said a healing prayer for me. And I, and, uh, I said to him, are you sure, Pastor, you know, I could go to a downtown Eastside church you know, maybe I don't really, you know, fit in here, right? And he said, no, Richard, you belong with us, right? And that acceptance was so comforting for me that I felt comfortable in getting on with my uh, activity with the church. And I wound up, uh, I took every class that was offered. Uh, it was, uh, I attended every prayer meeting. I uh, attended every Bible study. I got involved with uh, a discipleship class. I got involved with an alpha program. I got involved with cell groups. And I also got involved with our uh, homeless outreach program. And uh, I became a very active member of my church. And uh, without trying to brag or anything, uh, my, my pastor told me one time, Richard, you're vital to our church. Now, what would have happened if he didn't accept me? What would have happened? He said, well, okay, Richard, we're going to release you. You can go to downtown Eastside Church. He didn't judge me. He showed understanding and compassion. 
and he gave me a chance because he recognized who I am more than what I do. And the result of that was I'm an awesome member of that church, and I'm very happy there. So thank you for listening. So we have all these community members um, here that are uh, witnessing and supporting um, the Speakers Bureau event, but also I think all of the people that are here on this panel. And I'm curious um, if there was something that you could ask of the community um, in response to uh, both the crisis and to, in relationship to people who use drugs. Um, what's something that you would ask? I thought we were asking them to hire us. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Myself, personally, um, I ask that uh, I'm that I'm acknowledged. I guess that uh, acknowledged as, as a person of the community, and that I have a right to space. I suppose just basic things that mm -hmm. that, that humanity asks of of ourselves, of, of each other, uh, in the wider context, and that 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 be taken seriously. That um, we reserve judgment, you know, considering considering privilege, considering the loss and grief that this community is going through um, at the moment, and, and also the resilience and strength that is showing throughout uh, this, this crisis, because that's really what's gonna change things. And it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen overnight, like Kari said, we're not gonna solve things tonight. Um, it's gonna take you know, acceptance on everybody's part for a long-term a long -term acceptance, right? Um, over what we're a generation probably we're looking at of changing our thinking for, for young people to grow up with the basic truth and, and understanding and compassion and empathy that, uh, that you would show your neighbor in any situation that where you would see they were hurting and you know that they don't have advantage, that they're um, struggling against you know, powers and policies that, that uh, affect them, right? Sure. Yeah. I, I just want to go back to that um, acceptance thing that you were talking about. You know, I um, I saw Megaphone for three and a half years, and um, there was a guy that for the first two years, he I would say hi to him, and he, he would not acknowledge me for the first two years. And then one Christmas, he come by, and he dropped me a bag of change and bought his first Megaphone. <clears throat> and after that, for the next year and a half, he would come once, twice a week with a $20 bill, and he'd buy the megaphone off me and chat with me. Eventually, after a year and a half of that, he came to me and he said, hey, look, he says, I'm practically giving you a paycheck now. He says, if you want, you can come work up in my shop. He says, I need a guy to come in and clean in the afternoons. If you like, one day a week, five days a week. So I jumped on that. And uh, so for the first six months, I would clean. In the afternoons, waste baskets just when all the big stuff was done. And then uh, he eventually asked me to start coming in in the morning and then start casting gold and silver jewelry and, 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 and making molds and doing the alloys and, and, and trusting me to, to handle the gold and the, and the molds and, and things like that. And I felt at that point that I needed to tell him a little bit about me. And so I told him, I said, hey, look, I'm a drug addict. Have you seen me growing my beard real bad? That's a, that's a sign. You know, if, I'm, if I stop changing my clothes, that's a sign. I, I told him all the signs. I told him, look, watch my fingers. You see my big lighter callus on my thumb. I've been smoking too much. And he gave me more responsibility. <laughs> and, <laughs> and give me more hours. And, and, and I felt obliged to live up, like whole Renfrew woman, to live up to what he saw in me, and I, I work there today. I'm, I'm still there, it's been four years. So, so uh, acceptance of who I am, I, I find it, I see it, I can recognize it, and uh, I'm just happy to be here. Can I just say one more thing?
Can we have one more round of applause for everybody up here? Thank you all. Thank you. I'd now like to invite Jessica Hannon to come up to the center. And uh, you're going to lead us with some witness reflection. Thank you. Thanks, Kari. Uh, so my name is Jessica Hannon. I'm Megaphone's executive director. I'm very glad to introduce you to our witness panelists tonight and moderate this discussion on community, acceptance, and finding a way forward through the overdose crisis. And I'm a little short on time. I know we're uh, running a bit behind where we thought we were going to be. But before I invite our panelists up, I just wanted to take a quick moment to acknowledge the Speakers Bureau team. Though this is just the beginning of this pilot project, this is the final of the, the four public events that we're doing in this series. And I want to take the opportunity to acknowledge the heart, the generosity of spirit, the learning and the growing that this team has already done, and, and just communicate how, how proud and how honored I am to be working with all of you. So thank you for that. So now I'd like to invite our panelists to join me on stage. And as they wake, make their way up, I'll share a short introduction uh, for each. So Melissa, Deanna, and Leslie, please come on up. <laughs> Melissa Higgs is a principal at HCMA Architecture and Design, uh, our event partner for tonight. She is passionate about creating public buildings where communities come together and is a believer in the power of architecture and design as a catalyst for positive change in the world. In her work at HCMA, she's engaged with ideas about how public space design can include all people regardless of their socioeconomic status. Deanna Wing is the program coordinator for Central City Foundation, who is the presenting sponsor for Megaphone Speakers Bureau. Uh, and Central City is an organization that builds housing and other capital projects, invests in social enterprises that create jobs and opportunities, and funds hundreds of nonprofit organizations, including Megaphone. Leslie McBain is a co-founder of Mom Stop the Harm, a network of Canadian families whose loved ones have died from drug-related harms or who have struggled with substance use. Leslie lost her only child, Jordan, to an accidental opioid overdose in 2014 when he was just 25 years old. Soon after Jordan's death, Leslie became an advocate for more compassionate, evidence-based drug policies through co-founding Mom Stop the Harm. She's also the family engagement lead for the British Columbia Center on Substance Use. So in our discussion tonight, I'm interested in getting into what the words community, connection, and acceptance mean. What they look like, what they feel like, and how we can actively create them. From the way that our cities are designed, to how we relate as families, friends, and neighbors. What role can com community connection and acceptance play in ending the overdose crisis? And I, I want to unpack a little bit those ideas, because I'm, I tend to be a bit of a, a cynic naturally at heart. And sometimes when I hear those words, it can feel a little bit simplistic or superficial. Um, I think kind of they get tossed around, but we don't really talk about what it actually means. So I'm interested to talk through how those ideas can really translate into behavior. Um, and we'll get to that, but to begin for our panel, I'm curious uh, just to hear from folks, whoever would be interested in jumping in, um, what stood out to you as you listened to Chris's story and Nicholas's story and the, the peer, went, peer witness panel tonight? What, uh, what resonated, what surprised you? What do you think you'll leave with today? I'm closest. <laughs> so I'm Melissa, in case it wasn't clear. Um, and I want to just also say I'm a bit of a crier. So I've pulled myself together to get up here. Uh, I'm also a mother, as well as an architect. Um, and I think for me, the um, I, I think early on, Kari said, uh, he, he had talked about the idea of having a puzzle, that like we all hold knowledge, and uh, the idea of, of together, we can bring those pieces together. So I think uh, what draws me here and resonated with me is just gathering up how many of those pieces of the puzzle can I put together uh, to improve the work that I do. But I think um, for both Chris and Nicholas's stories, for me, that the, when you talk about unpacking connections, the thing that's, I know it in my heart, but when I hear a story that says uh, even just a single human connection, it changes people's lives so profoundly. Like I think we all get it and we know it, but we go about our regular lives without really uh, perhaps developing those connections. So I mean, I'll, I don't want to be about my work, but I think that's how do we find the opportunities to 
uh, create those connections, facilitate them. So that really um, moved me, was powerful for me. Hearing these stories tonight has um, just reinforced what I know that everyone who is who uses drugs, everyone who has struggled, everyone who has recovered, um, was born a beautiful little baby who was loved and cherished by someone, um, and how resilient human beings are given a chance. That same thing, you, if you have one person one day, like the Holt Renfrew lady, in your life, then you can, there is a chance, there's a possibility. What I've learned uh, in these five years, or really four years since I've been advocating for better drug policy, I could say the deepest learning that I have, have experienced is from people who use drugs. And I've learned what heart there is, what community there is, what um, everything that makes you all still be here. And I have also learned that the thing that, the reason we're losing people is not because people use drugs, it's because of the war on drugs. Um, and that's, I guess, at the core of what, what we do. I don't know where to start. I just, uh, I, I want to just thank you for allowing Central City Foundation to be a part of this because uh, you, you all and this project embodies what we really believe in, in that we all have intrinsic value, we all have a story to tell, and if we slow down and we connect, we can find solutions and we can improve lives and build hope together. So I just, I'm just filled with so much <laughs> emotions that I just, that's where I'm at. <laughs> so that's, like, that's my first start for that. So yeah. Um, so my first question, uh, Leslie, is for you. I'm curious. I think it's safe to assume that that a lot of people in this room, um, from speakers to uh, witnesses in the audience, have experienced um, the dynamic of substance use having challenging impacts on, on them or the people around them. Pe a lot of people in this room probably love someone who, who uses substances or who lives with addiction. Um, and something that Krista touched on in the opening was uh, that idea of tough love, um, you know, this sort of pop culture psychology around, um, you know, needing to set those, those really strong boundaries or um, push people away when they're dealing with substance use. And I'm curious, how do you respond um, to that messaging? Um, when, because it, it, it seems so at odds with this idea of acceptance and connection and, and the importance of community. What do you, how do you respond when people, you know, talk about tough love? That's something I do, I wouldn't say on a daily basis, but several times a week. I get um, all the emails and con contact information from Mom Stop the Harm comes directly to me. So I have listened to literally a thousand, almost a thousand stories over the last four years. Um, I have heard tough love so often. And one of my, I guess one of my big jobs is to say, why would you do that to someone you love? Why would you be tough? Why would you let them fall to the bottom? What do you think that, how is that ever gonna help? How is that gonna help someone to hit rock bottom? What rock bottom could mean is death. You know, it, there, there's no sense to it. So um, a lot of my messaging to families who are struggling with loved ones in addiction is, keep, hold that person close. Hold them as close as you can and still be safe. Um, there is a safety issue often. Um, you have to you have to make sure that you're safe, that your household's safe, that siblings and other people that you love are safe. But do, and there's this big uh, divide between enabling, which is a word I detest, because I know that what enabling in, in other people's lingo usually means is, and it was for myself, keeping, keeping the loved one alive. I did things I never thought I would do. Um, I didn't know anything about addiction. I didn't know anybody who was addicted that I knew of. Um, 
And I did things for my son to keep him alive that I never, I, you know, I bought drugs on the street. I paid off drug dealers. I did things that, um, you know, some people called them enabling. My, his dad, my ex, thought I was enabling him. Um, and all I could say was, well, you can call it what you want, but this is how it is, and this is how it is. Unfortunately, I wasn't lucky enough to keep him alive, but um, I put that message out there to every mom, and it's usually the moms who connect with me, saying, tough love doesn't work, A. B, it's awful, it's mean, it's not what you do as a, as a mother, or as a, you know, as a caregiver, so don't ever say tough love to yourself because it doesn't work. Look for help, look for support. Um, so I guess that's my stand on tough love. <laughs> tough love is just bullshit. It doesn't work. It's never going to work. So. Thank you, Leslie. I'm shifting gears a little bit. Um, Melissa, I'm wondering if you can, um, speaking from your perspective as an architect and um, thinking and talking a lot about public space, um, I'm curious if you can share a bit of your thinking around public space design and inclusion. Um, in thinking about this your, and your work, uh, I was thinking about that quote from Dr. Cornell West who said that justice is what love looks like in public. Um, and I'm curious around what messages our public spaces give to people who use drugs and what might just access to public space look like for people who use drugs? Just a little easy question. <laughs> I don't know where to start and I want to, I feel, I feel humbled even to be holding the microphone uh, in front of this group. So I don't have the answers, but I can say that I believe from experience, just like we we all feel in our heart that human connections make the difference, that we understand when we look around the city that certain spaces make us feel a certain way and certain make spaces make us feel like we belong or that we're comfortable or that it's an easy environment to make conversations with people. So I mean in really simple ways, I think whenever I see a park bench that has deterrence to people actually sitting on it, to people actually lying down on it, I feel kind of angry. And I think it was maybe, I can't remember if it was Nicholas or Chris who talked about the idea of right to space. Um, and so a lot of the work that I am fortunate enough to work on is public buildings. And so we often are talking to clients about what is, you know, what does it mean to be a member of the public? And if this is a public space, then everybody is welcome in that space unless they are potentially harmful to others. Um, and so I think part of what we do is educating decision makers and policymakers around space and what makes it important. But to me, it's a space where there is softness and it, and it perhaps could the city feel like it was embracing you and welcoming you and making you feel like you could connect with your peers. And I think that's different for everybody in different ways, but that's, my, that's a, the beginning of the thoughts on it, I think. Thank you. Um, this is a, a broad question anyone can answer. I'm curious kind of that idea about um, unpacking those, those concepts of acceptance and community and compassion. Um, I guess in, in whichever area you would be curious to answer that question, um, what do you think that acceptance, community, or compassion does look like um, in, in a family situation uh, with someone you love, in a community situation, in policy? What, how do we take those big picture values and, and actually put them into practice? What does that look like to anyone who would like to engage with that giant question? <laughs> Um, what, okay, so for many families, um, many families, when their loved one, and let's, I, I talk about kids mostly, but it can be a partner, a sibling, and so on, um, many people do not know what addiction looks like. They don't know what it, what addiction looks like, or feels like, or behaves like, and I think it, it, it behooves people, it, families, to learn that to learn about addiction, to learn that that person is not their addiction, that that person has an addiction and, is, and that's what's causing the behavior. Now I can say this and it sounds easy and it sounds, oh yeah, I'll do that, but it's really hard in families to be able to continue to hold that person close, to continue to support that person to, in a good way, and to continue to 
love them the way they deserve to be loved. So I think what it looks like in families is, is a lot about learning. It's a lot about trusting your love and trusting your loved one. Um, nobody, as we all know here, sets out to become addicted to drugs. People take drugs to mitigate pain, whatever that pain is. So you have to honor that pain. You have to look at that pain. What is that? Where, with my son, I didn't, I couldn't figure it out. Where is this coming from? Why? Why is he doing this? What's, what is the deal? And now, now, too late. I, I, I understand it. So what it looks like in families is a lot about learning and a lot about just trusting that beautiful baby that you brought into the world. That was lovely, and I'm going to take that home with me. Uh, but I, um, from a community perspective, I think, again, I have to say, this is it. This, is, this has been the compassion and the connection and uh, that you, uh, that the speakers of the Speakers Bureau could speak with such vulnerability and honesty and share their personal stories and to feel safe to do that in this community is um, really amazing, and I hope that you feel safe and you feel belonging here and amongst us, this community. So um, that's just something I wanted to say about that. I would maybe add, having a bit of time to listen to what you had to say and think about it, that I, that I am struck that in public buildings and in public space, I think the, a huge part of acceptance is just the feeling that you can be in that place. So it's, maybe it's a quiet invitation, not a loud invitation, but I find a lot of our public buildings, and I think libraries actually do a really great job of it, but the idea, and even this space here, where we have the space in between is actually the space where community happens and where connections happen. So how do we find ways to, uh, if you're coming to a place, you don't need to pay for something, you don't need to be part of a specific program, but that kind of in-between space where people can kind of just gather, and that's public spaces. But I often find a lot of time in public spaces, we don't set them up as though we are asking and allowing people the permission to just be in that space. So how do we find ways to do more of that? Um, I wish this conversation could continue. There's a lot more that, uh, that could happen here, including conversations about Fort St. John. But uh, I think that's all the time that we have for tonight. So thank you all. Thanks. Great job. Um, I would encourage you um, to not see this as the ending, but as a beginning. Again, to all of the people who have entrusted me to uh, support and hold uh, the space for the last four events, I just can't tell you how much it means to me. Um, I am, it's a very bittersweet feeling that I have, and there's something about um, when I feel that tension of the sweetness um, and that kind of bitterness that I know that I'm really fully alive and I'm in my right place. And um, that's the way I feel right now because I'm really gonna miss you all. And, I, and, I'm, gonna, and I'm gonna miss coming together like we have. Because this is special. Don't take for granted how powerful it is to come together and to, to witness each other in a deep and profound way, to talk about the things that we really care about and the places that we come from. We don't do it enough. We don't have ritual uh, kind of um, regular intervals of connection in this way, many of us. And so it's really special when we get this many people from all these different places in the world to come together and to be together in this way. It's actually really special. And so I just want you all to to remember how special it is, and to also know how the only reason it's happening is because you chose to come here tonight. You all made a choice to come here tonight, and it's special because you chose to come here. Every single one of you is just as important, like your presence is just as important as anyone else, mine or anyone else's. So I just want to say thank you. Much love. are incredible, and you witness that tonight, if you can find a way to help them influence institutions, places where you work, please hire these people. 
to share their wisdom and their expertise because it's very clear the way we have been doing things is not working. Thank you.